Welcome to the home of 100 to 1 Faith TV, the place for stories of amazing faith, overcoming impossible odds. I'm Larry Gent, and this is the message for Grace Hartwood United Methodist Church on February 20th, 2021. The Creator is still at work. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, we glory in the wonder of your creation. We see the stars, we hear the rolling thunder. Your power is throughout the universe proclaimed. But we also see darkness and despair, division and doubt. Move once more upon the surface of the deep, and let there be light. Amen. Our reading this morning is from Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. What are women and men that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hand. You put everything under their feet all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Our gospel reading is from John 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Our Old Testament reading is the first chapter of Genesis and the first three verses of chapter 2. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it, and it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and gathered the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so, the land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it, according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, 
Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the water teems and that moves about in it according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number, and fill the water in the seas, and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created humanity in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it. I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed, in all their vast array. This is the word of God for the people of God. And we all say, thanks be to God. Somehow the word myth has come to mean the exact opposite of what it's supposed to mean. We use the word myth to describe a popular misconception, a worn out old tale that we know is not true. But that's not what myth means. A myth is a story that tells a truth too deep for words. Myth is not 
concerned with journalistic facts, who, what, where, when, and why. Myth speaks of truth that cannot be measured or dissected or quantified. Myth tells of realities too big for human words, too great to fit on a printed page. Myth is similar to legend. Every old-time musician knows some version of the legend of John Henry. They all seem to agree that he was indeed a steel-driving man. Beyond that, the story gets a little fuzzy. Historians have tried for two centuries to find the historical facts behind that legend. Dozens of them claim to have uncovered the truth, that data that gave rise to the legend. There was a John Henry here in Virginia. Another one beat down the steam drill in the Big Bend Tunnel of West Virginia. Coal miners in Kentucky and Tennessee say he was one of their own. People in North and South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi all say their granddaddy told them the real story of working beside that mountain of a man. There is very good evidence that the original John Henry was one of those men, but no amount of historical research can reveal the mythic truth of this legendary man who fought against the power of machinery and won, but sacrificed his own life in the victory. The song says it plainly, a man ain't nothing but a man. But this myth gave courage to those who were ground under the wheels of progress and a word of warning to those who stood in its way. The man lived and died. That's a historical fact. But the legend lives on and that's the power of myth. And that's what I mean when I tell you this creation story is a myth. There are those who are trying to prove that this, is, this story is historically accurate. And there are those who scoff at it as a primitive representation of fact but neither of those camps can ever get at the truth of this story. The truth is too big for history or science. The truth is too real for that. The truth is that this earth, this world, this fragile blue spaceship hurtling through billions of miles and of emptiness and silence. This amazing creation bears the fingerprints of God, and it is good. It is very good. But this world did not begin that way. It began in chaos and confusion a world without rhyme or reason, time or season, a world of deep darkness and despair. Creation did not begin with a word. It began with a pregnant pause. The creator hovered over the depths. God embraced the darkness and emptiness. For you see, the Creator is not like me. Far too often I speak without a plan, I move without a purpose. God's plan came before God's Word. The Creator thought and dreamed and visioned before God spoke, 
And in that beginning, God thought of you. God planned this hour. You were in God's heart when that first word of creation was formed, and God was still thinking of you when the pregnant pause gave birth to that word of life. Let there be light. You were already there when God said that, and you are still there every time God speaks. Our creator did not wind up the world like some cosmic toy and then walk away to go play with other things. Our creator still speaks, but never without a plan. We human critters are many things. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. But we are not the most patient parts of creation. We want God to speak on command, and we want God to move when we say so. But the Creator will not be hurried. God still moves in pregnant silence. And God still moves into the darkness. This darkness is much more than the absence of light. This is the darkness that quenches hope and snuffs out life itself. It's the darkness that destroys hopes and dreams. And if you live on this earth, it's a darkness you have known or you will know. When the call comes in the middle of the night and says, she's gone. When the diagnosis says, it's cancer and it has spread. When the day is sunny and bright as two crisply uniformed young men knock on a parent's door when the door shuts behind you in the divorce court. It's chaos and confusion, darkness and despair. Life at those times is null and void. The world is hopeless and useless. That is the darkness where the creator still goes. Sometimes we're too numb to cry out Sometimes we're too angry to speak to God. Sometimes we just want to find a way out. Sometimes we demand that God should speak. But the Creator will not be hurried. God moves and embraces, but God does not speak until there's a plan. The pregnant pause is part of that plan. That pause is the beginning of God's new creation. And God is still in the new creation business. That's good to know when we behold the glory of a mountain sunset, when we watch the stars rise over the ocean waves, or when we hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees, and we hear the murmur of God's handiwork. But it's even better to know in the darkness, thick, dark, heavy darkness, when even God is silent. The silence of the Creator is never the end of the story. In those hours of darkness, God is making a plan. God is forming a new creation. And God is thinking of you. So that even in darkness and silence, we can say, Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, How great thou art! How great thou art. 
The Creator is still at work, and that is a truth too deep for words.